So we're going to get started. My name is Carmen Darmides, and I'm, I'm going to help facilitate a conversation. I'm going to introduce folks. But before I do that, um, I want to thank everybody in the audience for attending today and being part of this great relationship with the Northern Arapaho. And then I also want to welcome all of the Northern Arapaho that are here. Uh, welcome home. And other indigenous folks that are present, welcome also. Um, so before we get started, yesterday um, at the Youth Center, um, where is Miss Jenny and Patricio? Would you stand up, please? And Wolfstar, would you please stand up? And all of the student ambassadors that are present. I know Estela's here. Where is she? Somewhere. There she is. So please give them a round of applause. So yesterday at the Youth Center, Jenny and Patricio organized and worked with folks from Wind River to come down and make fry bread. So you missed it. It was great. And uh, we made fry bread and then also raised a teepee. And then the Buffalo family spoke about the importance of the buffalo, but also actually making a teepee out of buffalo hide. So. I just wanted to acknowledge that, that it's been really important. So I'm going to start by asking each person to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about themselves. I know some amazing things about each person, even that guy over there, which <laughs> happens to be my husband. Uh, <laughs> but I know some great things about them, but I want them to share through introduction who they are and some of the things that they do. And I want to start with Herb because he is amazing flute maker and other things, but I want him to tell you about that. Yeah, thank you, Carmen. Well, my name is Herb Welch, uh, 64 years old. I'm, uh, in my mind, I'm, I'm really no one special, uh, nor do I have anything, anything special to offer anyone. Uh, I just happen to, uh, for whatever reason, uh, I became involved in, in uh, many aspects that, that involve uh, historical events within our Arapo tribe. Um, you know, I, I don't claim to be anything special, nor do I claim to have any special knowledge or, uh, or uh, insight. The one thing that I was uh, taught as a young man was to, uh, when you're called upon, you have a responsibility to speak the knowledge that was passed on to you. And if you don't do that, then you're not being truthful and you're not, you're not carrying on that message that your ancestors suffered greatly to deliver to you. And it's uh, my obligation to share as much uh, information and knowledge that I have with others. So I don't want to speak too much on who I am or what I do. Uh, I'm just I'm just a common person uh, in a in a world an overwhelming world really. And I want to thank each of you for being here and uh, and listening to us. Thank you. And So humbly, I want you to know that Herb makes beautiful flutes. Um, and we have one in our home from him. And he makes amazing cedar boxes. Wow. And he makes them with love, and he tells you the story where he gathers the cedar oil and how he uses that. So we're very grateful for that. So I want to ask Jackie to introduce herself, but before she introduces herself, I want to say thank you because she honored me with making this ribbon skirt that I'm wearing. So these gifts and the medallion that I'm wearing, um, these are gifts not just of relationship, these are gifts of family. And so this is what happens when we sit down and we listen and get to know people, we become family. So Jackie, will you introduce yourself? Nanana, Dathuni Abe Hisse, Hinane, 
My English name is Jacqueline White. My Northern Arapaho name is Singing Crane Woman. I am Northern Arapaho and Chippewa Cree. My late husband was Crawford White Eagle Sr., who you've seen him in the, um, in the film here. It was really emotional for me to see that the first time I seen it, and even today, because I know what that meant to him, that relationship, and what that meant, not just for him, our family, but for all of our Rappo people, and for our future generations. Our elder people, our ceremonial people, that's their mind frame, that's their thought, always thinking about their future, the future generations, so that they can leave something for them that they will carry on in honor. Thank you. So, Ray, will you introduce yourself and say a little bit about the work you've done? Okay. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> You can tell where this is going. <laughs> Again, my name is uh, Ray Ramirez. I'm better known as Carmen's husband. <laughs> Most people just know me as that, not my name. So, but I'm proud of it. Uh, I've lived in. I'm a native Colorado. I was born in Colorado. I was born in Fort Collins a long, long time ago. Uh, went to school there. Uh, went to the army. Graduated from CSU and immediately left Colorado. And I was gone for quite a while. Uh, then moved back here uh, in 91. Mm -hmm. So we'd been here since 1991, living in Longmont. Uh, before I came here, uh, I was a, a community organizer in Arizona, then also uh, the director for the Department of Education for the Tohono O'odham Nation in Arizona. And I was that for almost 10 years. Uh, then I became the tribal administrator for the Isleta de Sur Pueblo for 10 years. And then I, when I moved here, I started working for the Native American Rights Fund in Boulder. And I worked for them for 26 years. Uh, I was one of their corporate officers, their editor, grant writer, among other things. Uh, and I just want to say that you know, what I said in the film is, I'm really proud to, to live in Longmont. You know, I'm proud of this city, I'm proud of the city council, you know, the city government, uh, everyone, all the staff. Uh, just makes my heart feel so good. Thank you. Janice, will you do us the honor? Introduce yourself. <laughs> So I'm Janice Rebin, as you know, and I'm president of Sister Cities and have been for, I don't know, six, seven years, something like that. And uh, four years ago, the mayor called me and said, hey, I want you to go to the reservation. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, Brian's a little persistent, as you can see. And uh, it took a couple phone calls, um, and uh, I agreed to go. And honestly, it's changed my life, getting to know all the wonderful people in Wind River and the wonderful people here in the city that have helped us. And it's just really been a really, it's been a great honor to work on this. So I'm gonna ask a couple of questions and then hopefully leave a little bit of time for folks uh, who have additional questions. Um, so I'm gonna ask Herb to, to talk a little bit. Um, we know that Crawford was very engaged in the beginning of this relationship as you were too, but I think it would be important for people to know why it's important to have spiritual leaders or elders support and take part in this kind of relationship building. <clears throat> I, I, wanted, I wanted to, um, I guess what I want to speak on is the fact that, um, as was featured in the film, uh, Nelson White Eagle and Crawford White Eagle were my older brothers and are my older brothers. Uh, my brother Crawford has since uh, passed on to the, to the home of the Arapaho, as we say. And uh, through, the, through these two men, uh, me being the younger brother, uh, maybe 20 years ago or so, they, they started to call on me and, and they insisted that I join them, that I sit with them. 
uh, my brothers told me that it was it was time that I, I took my place, wherever that may be or whatever that may be. So over 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 uh, over uh, many discussions and, and ceremonies and and so on, uh, my brothers entrusted me uh, to become their spokesperson. Uh, their positions in, within their tribe prevented them from from taking sides. They're, they always had to have uh, neutrality. They always had to be neutral in matters. But they had a lot of issues that they wanted uh, uh, presented. And, and they wanted uh, to make sure that the, the, the goals that, that they had and the ideas that they had uh, were spoken in some way, in some form. So um, thinking back, you know, uh, I, I'm long-winded, as I, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned to uh, Carmen and, and everyone here this morning, but I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, basically, uh, as far as the sister cities and our relationship with the state of Colorado and Longmont and uh, the sister cities of, of, of Longmont, uh, it, was, it was an opportunity for uh, our elders, our ceremonial people, to, to make a statement and yet create bonds and, and uh, bridges between our cultures and uh, yet remind the people of Colorado, uh, remind Longmont, the Front Range, that we Arapaho, we're still alive. And we still believe that this is our home, our, our homeland. Uh, my ancestors, uh, you know, they suffered a great injustice so that I could be here, so that I could speak in front of you. And their prayers on those over 150 years ago, you know, uh, we are Apple people, we always pray. We always remember our ancestors, and we always pray for the future, those not yet born, our children, our grandchildren, so on. And the future in our generations, and, and many years back, uh, decades ago, uh, my ancestors offered prayers that at some point that I would deliver a message. And my prayers are that my children, my grandchildren, my descendants, that they'll deliver a message that'll be pretty much in line with, with what, I, what I know and what I was taught. And that is that we must remain steadfast and we must hold on to who we are, our identities, our language, our values, our traditions, our teachings, our culture, all of these things make up who we are as Arapaho people. Now, we're not the only tribe that occupied Colorado, but what we believe as Arapaho people that this is still our home. And we come here, when we Arapaho people come to Colorado, we don't say we're going to Colorado, we say we're gonna go home to our homelands, we're going to our homelands. You know, I hear that all the time. And, uh, uh, there's this, you know, there's so much I could speak on, but I, I know we, we don't have all day. But, uh, uh, I just wanted to let each of you know that uh, me being here today, yet it has a lot of meaning to me, because my family, my ancestors were involved, and they lived here. And when the Rocky Mountain uh, National Park, or not, yeah, Rocky Mountain National Park was first formulated, uh, my great grandfather, uh, he was asked to come down and to be the translator for, for their two old uh, men who helped to map and, and rename and translate the names of, of the Arapaho uh, locations within Rocky Mountain National Park. So uh, my grandfather's name was Thomas Crispin, and uh, that was my grandmother's uh, father. So for me, coming to Colorado, it has great meaning because I know my grandfather, my great-grandfathers, and my ancestors walk these very lands, these mountain trails, these plains, these rivers, this location, before there was ever a, a structure here, they, they, they walked this land, and they left prayer, and they left belief, and it's still here. It's still here in the soil, it's in the air, it's in the water, and it, it, it's, uh, there's no end to it. They say, you know, we call it Hattik Jatniya Nunin it means life will continue on in a good way. 
And, and uh, that's kind of the message that I wanted to make sure that I, uh, that I delivered today because, uh, you know, my brother Crawford, he really believed that we have to build those bridges. But before we can build those bridges, we have to, we have to bring acknowledgement and we have to bring education to each, to one another, that there was many atrocities that happened to the Arapaho people. And to, to create, to get past, you know, you hear a lot of words about closure uh, and healing. But before we get there, we have to acknowledge the wrongs that were done. And we're not here to, to guilt anyone into treating us as a human being. We're here to educate you and teach you that long before we were here, uh, there was bad things done on this land. And we're here to fix it. We're here to make it better. And we're here to start that healing process. So with that, I want to say thank you. Thank you, my relations. So I think it's very important that throughout this process, we have learned history. We have acknowledged that there was a lot of atrocities. Mm. And that we've tried to teach to our youth ambassadors as well as their families. Um, and to also, again, make uh, help uh, not only start the healing, but help uh, folks from Northern Rapo feel like Returning home means that you also have people here that will be welcoming. So that's important. Uh, one of the films that we saw throughout this month is called Home From School. Mm -hmm. And it spoke about the returning the remains of Arapaho children. One of the things that we did very much in the beginning was acknowledging the impact of boarding schools that has had on many tribes and the generational trauma that it has created. So we didn't just educate, we wanted to take that to heart and understand, which is why you saw that the first group of kids that came, they didn't go to a host home, they went to our home as a group uh, because we wanted to begin to build that relationship. But I wanted Jackie to uh, talk a little bit about children and the importance of children to Native communities um, because Jackie uh, fed our kids when they went up to Wind River. She made a feast for them. But I wanted to ask her if she could tell us about the importance of building trust in order for the tribe and families to uh, have their children come spend time with us. Jackie? Thank you, Carmen. Um, when I think about it and think about all the things that she just talked about, about the boarding schools and the intergenerational trauma, a lot of people think, like, why don't they just get over it, you know? And that's really uh, racist. So don't ever say that to people, but when I think about it, what, what does that mean? What does that look like, especially for our children? Because through that, that sick cycle that was inflicted upon us and our ancestors, our grandmothers, our grandfathers. You know, it's, um, we still live it in this everyday life. Each one of us, all of our Rapo people. What does that look like, those abuses? You know, my grandmother was punished for speaking her language. They cut her hair. They physically abused them. They sexually abused them. They abused them in every possible way. And a lot of them were killed. And they were buried there. Unmarked graves. That's what happened to our people. And we still live it today because of the things that happened to our ancestors that was handed down from these priests and nuns and people that were raising them. My mother, there was 13 of them, 13 of her and her, her siblings. My uncle was the youngest. He was five years old when they took him from their home to the school to, to kill the Indian and save the child is what it was all about with the government. They were separated. They never were given the opportunity to have a relationship with each other, their siblings. They were punished if they were caught 
around their brothers or their sisters. And when they were abused and the things that happened to them, when they grew up, a lot of the people go back into the community on the reservations or wherever they were living and inflicted that upon other family people and people in the community. And those kind of things happen from generation to generation. And my father, he went to boarding school where my late husband Crawford White Eagle Sr. went to school at St. Stephen's, which is still standing today. It wasn't, it wasn't the stories that I've heard were not good. My, um, my late husband Crawford, he would talk about those things. They would get up at four o'clock in the morning and they would put them out in the fields to go work out there. When they would get done, they would feed them some oatmeal or something to eat and then they would go to school and at nighttime they would beat them with sticks. They would come in there and, you know, if they weren't listening to them. There was a lot of, um, a lot of trauma that happened in those boarding schools. My husband was one of the few that held on to their way of life, what it means to be a rap hole. What that means for our children to want that bitter life, to have a life, a different way of life, what was done to them. The number one basis of who we are as Arapaho people in our way of life is pathothity. Pathothity. That means love for one another, care for one another, help one another. And that was always taught to us in, in our home for my husband and all those good things about what it means to be a Rapaho. We're strong, we're resilient, we continue on, we overcome any challenges that come in our way. Whatever that looks like, we overcome that. And so what was important with the sister cities and building that relationship with the Arapaho people you know, in our children, it was to expose them to another way of life. That music, art, culture, something away from the reservation, you know, coming to our homelands. And it's true when uh, what Herb said about when we come here. We always refer to coming here as coming to our homelands. That's what we we carry on from generation to generation as well. You know, my daughter will star, you know, she um, she's a part of Sister Cities. And from day one, you know, um, the people of Longmont become our family. The more we learned about each other, the more we shared. And it's not just about having a relationship, but truly being family. And what does that look like? You know, it looks like taking care of each other, helping each other. Wolfstar has two other sets of parents here in Longmont, Carmen and Ray, and they spoil her. <laughs> Anything she gets, she gets whatever she wants. She has her own room in their house. <laughs> so she comes here whenever she wants and um, she gets that love from them. Because from, um, from day one, when my husband left this earth, they looked after her. They loved her. And the same with Sam and Cherie. There's, she has another set of parents. And um, I recently gifted them ribbon skirts. 
I'm like, this time I'm going to bring the mother something. And I sew, you know, I um, several years ago, my husband Crawford, he told me, he said, Jackie, I'm going to make jewelry and you're going to sew. And I'm like, well, I don't know how to sew. <laughs> he goes, well, you're going to learn. I'm going to buy you a machine. <laughs> so he did. And I started learning how to um, make skirts and what that means. I'm not a traditional skirt maker. I make whatever's in my heart and what I think about those people that I'm making it for. I put a lot of love and prayer into each skirt that I make to who it goes to. So this time I brought them for Wolf Star's uh, Longmont mothers, for um, Cherie and uh, Carmen. So um, I hope that answers your question. Sorry, I didn't mean to get sidetracked. No, no, no. <laughs> That was perfect, and we'll be showing off our ribbon skirts over in the lobby. There's Cherie, so we'll be showing off our ribbon skirts later. Um, but as you can tell, what Jackie just said, and the impact of boarding schools, and the, my husband wrote an article about kill the Indian, save the man, and how that was carried out. But I want you to know that one of the things that we've done with our youth ambassadors is uh, uh, manifest destiny exercise so that the youth and their families understand history and that they are part of that next generation that not only could have the courage to stand up and acknowledge the wrongs, but have the courage to then form friendships and become family. Uh, so for that, we're always very grateful. Uh, and I was going to ask Ray um, if you could quickly <laughs> um, so if you could just share why do you think these kinds of relationships with sovereign tribal nations are important I'm not even sure if I have to answer that after everything's been said and words from the film I think all the answers are, are there uh, You know, uh, as citizens of, of this country, of the United States, you know, we sure don't know our true history. And, uh, and that's really a shame. Uh, we should. It'd make us prouder. It'd make us stronger. And it'd make us for sure a lot wiser than we currently are. And that's one thing we have to try to achieve, is, is change that, change that mindset. You know, there was a Holocaust that happened in this country that was horrible. It made the Holocaust in Germany look like kindergarten's play. Mm. You know, after the Holocaust in Germany, you know, in Germany there, you have to teach about the Holocaust in their schools there, because they don't want anybody to forget so every child that goes to school in Germany learns about the Holocaust. What do our children learn here? About this Holocaust that happened here? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And we can't heal. As a country, we can't heal as a people until we understand that. And we come to terms with it. And, uh, you know, establishing a relationship like this with, with a, another sovereign tribal nation, I think is the beginning of that. Where each one of us in here will start that healing process. Not only healing of the people that were harmed, but healing of ourselves. Because healing's a two-way street. We, we all have to heal. And we can't just say to somebody, you know, we're sorry. Uh, it has to go a lot further than that. And again, I, I think this relationship is a beautiful beginning of that. But we have a long way to go. There's other things that need to happen. And uh, I won't say what, because I'll get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I'm going to ask Janice if she could just briefly talk about it, because um, as we've said before, this is the first time in this country, as well as internationally, that there has ever been a sister city relationship with a sovereign tribal nation. Uh, so it's never happened. So city of Longmont is the first. But Janice, do you want to talk about how not so easy it was when that <laughs> idea came up? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, it, four years ago, as I mentioned earlier, um, I was invited to go to the reservation by Mayor Bagley. And at the time, you know, there was no role model. There was nobody I could call and say, okay, we're going to go do this. What do we need to do? Or what do we need to know? <laughs> so, um, and it was, we were told, actually, not to do this. And I don't know if it was, I'm a little bit stubborn. Um, or, you know, Brian was very tenacious or something. But um, it, it, it came to be that we did go. Um, there were, I think, about 15 of us on that first trip. Um, and for me, it was, we were greeted with open arms and open hearts. I had no idea what to expect when we got started. Um, and every time I've been to the reservation since, or had my friends and family come down here, um, it's it's been just a life changing experience. Um, the warmth and ca compassion and sharing um, between uh, both sides has been just a, a really beautiful thing to see. Um, watching our children um, in uh, from Longmont go up to the reservation and get to experience Sundance is something I won't forget. And and trying to tear apart the kids so the kids could go home. They didn't want to leave and because they had made really good friends here, and our students here had made really good friends. Got a chance to talk and check in with some of those kids um, because four of the students that went to the reservation this summer are going on our other exchanges now to Japan and Mexico. And uh, you know they wouldn't probably have done that otherwise. Um, so we are really excited to create a program where there is mutual learning, um, not only among the children, but among their parents in the wider community. So I hope, I hope that answers your question, Carmen. It does. Thank you. I'm going to ask one last question, and I think Justin is in the booth, so I don't know if we're going to have time for a Q&A. Uh, but he's got a mic yeah, in his hand, so it like looks it. like it. So get ready if you have questions. But I'm going to ask each of you if you could just share, what would you like to see in the future with this relationship? And we'll start with our... Well, thank you for that question, Carmen. Uh, <clears throat> you know, as I spoke earlier, I, I, uh, the, the reason why I'm here is I want to make sure that the message that my brother Crawford, uh, White Eagle, wanted to deliver is, is still uh, is still in, in the play in play, and, and that was that. You know, we have to we have to move forward. But we can never move forward unless we, until we acknowledge the past. There was, a, there was, uh, you know, there was a lot of suffering on our part, the, the native peoples. And uh, we, we, what we want to do, and, and the goal was, to make sure that we brought awareness to to the people of Colorado. And, and uh, you know, as I spoke earlier uh, during the luncheon, I was talking with a gentleman. And, I, and I, I mentioned to him, you know, I said, Colorado is a beautiful, beautiful state. Beautiful people, accepting people, open arms, people with open arms. And, and very understanding and, and very, uh, very uh, uh, compassionate. Except when it comes to the Arapaho people. Because we, we are the original owners of this land. This is our home. And it's very hard to find anyone in Colorado previously that would say, you know what? This is Arapaho land. This is the Cheyenne people's land. This is the Ute people's land. They didn't want to acknowledge that because Colorado is, very, is a very prosperous, prosperous place. Except to us, those that were pushed out of Colorado. So what I wanted to speak on really quickly is, just to put things into context, I want you guys to understand this. 
um, or realize this, uh, and I want to share this with you. My grandfather, his name was Herbert Welch. He was born around 1870. My dad was born in 1916. I was born in 1958. So for me, three generations back, my grandfather was born a free human being to walk this earth wherever he wanted to, to not have any constraints on him except those that were expected, put upon him by his own people. In a short amount of time, his first recollections were being at Fort Robinson, Nebraska, which was called Red Clouds Agency. That was his first recollections of life. He was about three or four years old, around 1874 or so. And he was given this name, Herbert Welch, because we Arapaho people were driven from Colorado. And we, we uh, our Ayala tribes are always the, the Sioux and the Cheyenne people, the Lakota and the Cheyenne people. So naturally, we, we, we bonded together for protection. So the Arapaho at that time, we migrated uh, northward into the Black Hills area, and, and we joined Red Cloud's people and, the, and our Cheyenne people. The, uh, together, you know, we're, we're known as the Allied Tribes. So my grandfather's re first recollections are being at Red Cloud's agency. Now, Red Cloud had a war with the United States government, and he closed the Bozeman Trail. And, and he utilized the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, and the Lakota people to do that. The government couldn't get back, couldn't get to the gold fields of Montana, so he had to negotiate with the Red Cloud. And they gave Red Cloud his own agency, and he signed a peace treaty. And the Arapaho uh, were invited to join Red Cloud, and we did. So this is where my grandfather's first recollections are. You know, he was born a free man, and in a short amount of time, he became a prisoner of war. He was moved, eventually, the Arapaho were eventually moved to the Wind River Reservation here in Wyoming to join the Shoshone people. The Shoshone people are our traditional enemies, yet we were forced to live with them. Eventually we had to buy, seriously, we had to buy half of the Shoshone reservation so that we could have our own home. And we're the only tribe in the United States that ever had to buy our own land. So my, my grandfather, Herbert Welch, went quickly from being a, few, a free human being to a prisoner of war. And then when he got here to Wind River, at, at Wind River, he was selected, not only selected, but forced to go to Carlisle Indian School. Carlisle Indian School is notorious, a notorious place in, in the Indian communities for killing our culture and for our genocide. They, they committed great travesties against us. Uh, it, it, it's hard to phantom, phantom but my grandfather and men like him and children like him went through in the Indian world, but there's thousands and thousands of victims of boarding schools. As my sister-in-law Jackie mentioned, my brothers, they went to boarding schools as well. I was fortunate that boarding schools were done when my time came. And even to this day, there still are boarding schools that, are ch that we send our children to. When, you know, when, when are we going to realize that we're destroying our own culture by doing so. And my sister Jack, my sister-in-law Jackie, she went to a boarding school. The one thing that was told to me when I was young was that no matter where we go, no matter what we do, we as a, as an Indian people, we are we are we are all we have all been affected by boarding schools, because boarding schools were made to to kill, as 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 was stated, you know, kill kill the Indian and save the man basically kill our culture and, and, and uh, create a new human being in the likeness of, of uh, popular society. And they didn't realize the damage that they were doing to us, but we realized it. And very few tribes to this day held on to who we are as, as Native people, our identities, our ceremonies, our way of life. We Arapaho, we're one of those few people who have done that. So for us, to build these bridges with the people of Colorado, the governments, the entities, uh, what we're doing here in Longmont today. We're not, we're not skimming over what happened, but we're doing our best to meet in the middle, both sides acknowledging the damage and the hurt that was caused and done to us, yet finding a source, finding a point of where we can create uh, a healing, uh, uh, 
Well, I don't think we'll ever find closure because it's it's a huge, you know, this is a huge thing. And we Arapaho people, you know, we, we, the the focus that I was told was that we're, what we want and what we need before we can start healing is we need to make sure that Colorado is aware of what happened to the Arapaho people and they make amends, whether that be reparations or, or uh, uh, compensation. In some way, some form, there has to be, instead of we Arapaho constantly giving as is Brian talked about, uh, maybe it's time for uh, Colorado to give back. That is something, that is a message, and that is something that, that I, mean, I feel it needs to be delivered. And, and it's, it's hurtful, it's, it's hard to talk about that because it's hard for us to say, well, you know what? That wasn't me, that was my grandfather or his grandfather. They might have done some wrongs, but I didn't do anything, you know, I, I never hurt you. I, I didn't do anything to you. You know, whatever, whatever happened back then had nothing to do with me. Or maybe you didn't, maybe it had nothing to do with you. But you, but you, you, you know, you, uh, I guess you, uh, I guess the word was you, you, you inherited what your ancestors built upon the misery of the indigenous people. And then in that way, you, you carry some responsibility. And, and I'm not trying to guilt anyone. I'm just trying to share how we feel as, as Native people. Uh, I, you know, this discussion could go all day and I can talk all day, but I'm hungry. <laughs> so <laughs> I just want to say thank you. And, 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 I, and, I, and I, I appreciate uh, each of you uh, for listening to me and, and allowing me to be here. Thank you. So um, I'm, I'm going to ask Jackie, and I'm going to ask Janice. I think I know what Ray, but I'm going to skip Ray. <laughs> Ray, Ray. <laughs> but Ray. You, you can tell how important it is for us to have heart conversations, not general conversations. These are conversations from the heart. They go back generations, mm. and that we all have a part that we can do. So Jackie, what would you like to see in the future with this relationship? I would like to see Longmont sister cities uh, continue to plant that seed with their youth mm -hmm. so that they can um, be educated about our people, our way of life, and continue that, that relationship. And like what my, Cro my uh, late husband Crawford said, love them. That's what I want to see. Thank you. So I'm going to let Ray answer quickly, babe. <laughs> I have something to say. First of all, I want to tell a really short story. Oh, no. <laughs> it's short, I promise. Years ago, I was working with uh, the Catawba Nation in South Carolina uh, through the Native American Rights Fund, trying to get some of their land back that was taken by the state of South Carolina. You know, it was forcefully taken. Everything they had was taken. And at, at that time, uh, the chief of the tribe was Gilbert Blue, uh, a very articulate leader of the tribe. And he was making a presentation at the uh, University of South Carolina uh, about their battle of trying to get their land back. And, uh, you know, he went through the whole history explaining everything. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought somebody was telling me not to. Uh, anyway, I, there were people in the audience that were getting very irritated by what he was saying. And finally, this one guy stood up and he just said, wait a minute, everything you're saying is just bullshit. He said, you're trying to tell me that if my grandfather and father were, were horse thieves, then that makes me a horse thief. And Chief Blue just calmly looked at him and said, if you still have the horse. <laughs> and that's what I'm getting at is, what I'd like to see is land back. The tribe deserves it.
you know, this state, this county, this city can afford to do that. Mm -hmm. Give some land back without strings. Thank you. Thank you. Janice. So um, it's one, it is planting a seed. It's eight families every year or the wider community. Um, and it's a journey. Um, we're figuring this out and truly what I hope for is that not only do we change this community, but other communities model what we've done and then we can start to make real change. Imagine if every city along the Front Range reached out to displaced tribes. The power in that, the understanding in that. Um, four years ago, I didn't even think, I mean, I didn't have any, <laughs> any, any thought about this at all. Um, and I can truly tell you, it is um, a blessing to get to know my, my family up on the reservation and, and to um, share the education here in this community. So thank you very much. And we do have some gifts. Yes. And so. Thank you so much. Thank you. So gift exchange in every culture is very important, but it has been very important uh, with the Northern Arapaho in understanding that we give from the heart and we listen so that we can create a welcoming back to their homelands. So we're going to have... Justin, if you'll raise your hand, I think we have time for three questions. So I think there's one over here, Justin, up front. Um, do you go into the local schools no. to talk about uh, what you t you've been talking about here? In Longmont or on the res, are you talking about? In Longmont. <laughs> Well, I, I could use some volunteers that would like to take that on. Um, Sister Cities is all volunteer. Um, we haven't done that outreach yet, uh, but that would be something that would be a wonderful addition to our programs. And the other thing that I would say very quickly, if you're a grandparent or a parent, ask the teachers ask, and I know there's a teacher in the room somewhere, <laughs> ask the teacher, ask the principals, what are they teaching about the history of Native Americans beyond the one day? Please. So there's one more question. We got, there's a question down here. Wolfstar. Wolfstar. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, one thing I uh, really want to highlight is the youth. And I feel like a seat up on this panel is missing, and that's a place for the youth. And I feel like their input is so important, especially like I have the privilege to work with and see the youth and what they learned. And like they could tell you so like so much amazing things of like what you're talking about is reflected on them. And I feel like and oh, they're so amazing in what they learn, and they're so thankful of this experience. So I guess that's like some feedback. Like with Janice, like we could um, really highlight their experience in the next film, maybe, or you know, just. But that's just one thing I really would love to highlight. As I recall, <laughs> so we did interview Wolf Star, um, and while she was present at the creation of this relationship, um, there is footage that I do hope gets um, put into the next round of you. But representing their youth. I think we got time for one more question. So uh, welcome home, and thank you. 
And I'm wondering how we could learn more about the Northern Arapaho peoples and could we visit the Wind River Reservation? Well, uh, to answer your question, yeah, I, it's always it's always said that you know you're you're more than welcome. I always tell anybody that that listens to me, you know, they're unfortunate to hear me, but uh, you know I always tell everybody you're more than welcome to come to our reservation. You're more than welcome to come to my home, uh, my family. You know, we, we would uh, we welcome you with open arms, and, and treat you uh, as if you were family. Uh, you know, the, living on the Wind River Indian Reservation uh, about 20 years ago on a, a program, Paul Harvey, you know, he, he said that if you ever want to get away with murder in the United States, move to the Wind River Indian Reservation. That's how he characterized us. That's far from the truth. We're like everywhere else. I mean, bad things happen. Good things happen. There's bad people. There's good people. I can tell you this, um, you know, my wife, she worked in the border towns, in the both, both of the hospitals, Land and Riverton Hospital. She worked there for a lot of years. And the one thing that she recognized and knew immediately was all the non-natives, they would avoid the reservation. They wouldn't drive through the reservation. They would go around. And, the, and, and even to this day, my granddaughter tells me, you know, you know, the people that she, you know, she 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 intentionally chose to go off the reservation to a non-native school just so that she could get that experience, because she has plans for herself. And I and and I'm so proud of her. My my uh, my granddaughter Markel, she's a beautiful child, and I and you know I I just want her to understand that you know the world is a big place, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's hostile, and sometimes it can be a a good. You can just find good people in it no matter where you go. So the one thing I wanted to tell you is that you're always welcome to come to our reservation. Uh, and our people are, are open-minded and open-hearted. And uh, once you're accepted, just just like Brian found out, you, know, you become family quick. You, you become someone that is endeared and, and, and uh, you're trusted. Uh, we're, we're not... Uh, you know, we're not uh, cold-hearted or uh, we're not uncaring and, and we're definitely not savage. <laughs> you know, we're just like anybody else anywhere you would go. Uh, the only thing that, that makes us different is that we're tribal. Whereas in uh, modern society, you know, you, you want to shoot for the brass ring and, and whoever dies with the most wins, right? It's not so in the Indian world. You know, uh, we believe that we don't eat unless everybody eats. We don't, we don't get warm or stay warm unless everybody's warm. You know, we're all, we're all inclusive. In Arapa, we call it basi, all of us, we're all together in this, all my relatives. That's what we mean when we say that. You know, if, it's, if, if I'm hoarding anything, then I'm hurting my family. If I'm, if I'm trying to build my wealth portfolio and, and I can't take it with me, that's crazy, right? I need to share that with my family and make sure that they're well fed, they're well taken care of, and that they're completely loved. Because how else am I going to show them this? I can't take that portfolio with me. I can't take all that wealth with me. So I have to leave it somewhere. I'm not going to build it up. I'm going to share it today because tomorrow is not promised. That's how we believe. So I'm going to share that with you today. It's feast or famine. So if you come to my house, prepare for famine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I would say, lastly, uh, that there are opportunities. This is part of what we're doing with Sister Cities, is not only welcoming Northern Arapaho folks back home, but also having them come to, as Herb said, educate us and share that with us. And then our children have gone up there once, and our children will go up again. But we also need adults to hang out. Mm -hmm. So uh, please talk to Sister Cities about opportunities, the chaperones, and what you can do. And as Herb said, go. Go mm -hmm. visit the reservation. Mm -hmm. Just uh, make sure you have a full tank of gas. <laughs> yeah. 
there's a story to that, but <laughs> it's a it's a Bagley story about running out of gas, and <laughs> there's not a lot of gas stations on the reservation. So, <laughs> um, but we want to thank everyone, and most of all, we want to thank Herb and Jackie for being here with us this afternoon. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you.